Hey everyone, Jeremy L. Jones here, author of Ruins of Empire. We're still on break for a little while longer while the second book of the Ruins of Empire series, Templum Venerous, is getting a few coats of polish before it gets kicked out into the world. Pre-sales are set to begin soon, so keep your eyes on this feed for information about how you, yes you, can get a copy of Templum Venerous before anybody else. Except for me, I managed to get a copy. Anyway, we continue with the series of short stories we called The Darkness of Titan. These stories tell a first-hand account of how a far-flung mining colony in the 22nd century became a ruined society on the brink of religious warfare by the 31st. Thank you to everyone who's left us a review so far. Keep them coming in. They help appease the podcast gods and help more people find this little project. And for the latest news on the podcast or books, you can find us on Twitter or Facebook at Ruins of Empire or at www.ruinsofempirebook.com. And now, without further ado... The third story of the darkness of Titan, the gods of Titan. What makes a person good? Are people naturally inclined toward good? Or is it only the fear of punishment that keeps them from acting on their basest impulses? It was late at night, or at least what passed for night on this abomination of human creation. I had been awake for almost thirty hours, and yet the sun was just starting to dip below the mountains. Saturn never moved. One of my aides, a young man named Sanja, burst through the door. He was a lifer, like me. He spoke Esperanto with a distinct Bengali accent. He stopped by the desk and just stood. By the way he entered, he had to tell me something important. And, by the way he waited without speaking... I knew that he didn't want to tell me. It's over, I asked, knowing the answer before he said a word. He nodded. The last of them have retreated, sir. Reports say the last person has been overrun. There's no way to hold the refineries. Captain Zislav is on the line for you. Thank you, Sanja, I said. When he left the room, I picked up the receiver from the black phone sitting on my desk. It's a funny thing, those conventions we brought from Earth. I could just as well use my Omnipad or even my neural implants to talk to the captain. But something about using a device shaped like an old 20th century phone brings me comfort. Keeps me connected to a world I left behind. I held the receiver up to my face. And the captain said, Mr. Hillman, are you ready to end this? Before I can surrender the city, I said into the receiver, I need to know what is going to happen to the people. A lot of them have been promised transport back to Earth, and... Listen to me carefully. There is no going back to Earth, not for a while. You've got to tell your people that. Why don't you? I asked. My people have deserted me, and they flock to your ranks. I took a deep breath. Transplanetary energy promised the people. Transplanetary energy isn't a thing anymore. Interstellar Resources now owns it, and everything it owned, including Titan. You don't own us, I said. Bring your own people to mine this moon. The people here have suffered enough. The captain started to yell at me, and I placed the handset back on the receiver. Matthew 2635 Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. When I was a child, I believed that people were good. I believed that people, given the choice, would do what was right. There was, of course, evil in this world, but it was a corruption that pulled people down a path of darkness. But if they could see the light, they could be redeemed. My name is Samuel T. Hilbert from Houston, Texas. But people here just call me the man from Houston. Where I grew up, there were still churches. And I don't mean those ancient cathedrals in Europe. They're like those pretty actresses that pay a fortune to keep their body in stasis once they die. They are empty shells that the people keep around because they look good, but have long since lost the spirit that made them worth looking at in the first place. I'm talking about actual churches where people get together and thank God for each and every day. Isaiah 45.5 teaches us, I am the Lord. And there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. I remember when I was a kid, I and my mama, one of the few families that still went to that little white building nestled amongst the skyscrapers. 
We'd sing songs that the rest of the people had long forgotten. We gave thanks to the God that set in motion a universe that all these people took for granted. One day when we were coming home from church, I asked my mama why none of the friends were ever there with me. She told me that the world had moved on, that it went and got growed up, that we as people, like the arrogant youth that leaves his family's home for the first time, wanted to believe they could get by without no help from nobody. We went to church, she told me, so that the Lord's arms would always be open for when our people realized the error of our ways. We went so that the world would not be forgotten by its maker. Romans 12.1 asks every man, woman, and child to, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I asked her how do people know how to be good if they don't go to church. She paused for a moment and said, People are inclined to good, but when times are hard and the whole world seems to be falling down around us, it's easy to lose our way. The light of God keeps us on the righteous path when others would fall off. Matthew 7.13 Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide. And the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those that enter it are many. People go to Titan for two reasons. Short-timers come to earn their fortune, so that they may provide a comfortable life for their family back home. Those people arrive, work, and leave as soon as they got enough money. The rest of us are lifers. People like me never found anything on earth worth sticking around for. This place was not created by any god. He had intended this to be a cold, lifeless world. Humans made the air breathable. They made it possible for the trees to grow. They made it so this place could be a home to our species. I sometimes wonder if God resented us for meddling with his creation. If the good Lord had intended for people to live on Titan, he would have made Titan livable, wouldn't he? I left my office after that call and went to my private residence. It was, perhaps, the last night of relative comfort I could look forward to. Even now, the armies of Interstellar were mopping up and getting ready to take the city. The people who were left there, those that hadn't already joined Interstellar in overthrowing the rightful government of Titan, called for my arrest. I saw the reports of demonstrations where I was burned in effigy and decried as a war criminal. If they only knew what Interstellar resources would force on them, I would be hailed as a hero. Psalm 41.9 Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. No matter how tired I was, I couldn't sleep. So I laid in my bed and read my mother's Bible. It was the only thing I still had from Earth. I tucked it away until that night because, in a world built by humanity's understanding and mastery of nature, words from a thousand years ago seemed pointless. That was before I realized that all of this, the technological marvel that was Cassini Bay Refineries, the hub of culture and science that was Ligaya City. All of it was just one transport ship away from complete collapse. I laid back and opened the Bible to a random page. It was in the book of Isaiah. My mother used to quote from it, saying it was Jesus' favorite because it spoke of salvation. My eyes drifted to one passage. Isaiah 31.5 Like birds hovering, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will spare and rescue it. 34, 9. The streams of Edom will be filled with burning pitch, and the ground will be covered with fire. 53. I am the one who sends the darkness out across the skies. I had what my mother would have called a vision. We've always known that, that in theory people could fly on Titan. Company policy forbade such experiments from being carried out for fear of injury, but a few had managed it anyway was not a great feat to build the weapons. Their basis was the environmental suits used by the workers when it was necessary to venture towards the moon's poles and away from the relative warmth near the equator. The wings were made larger and of a polycarbonate weave to take full advantage of the extra air. Thrusters were added to the feet, piped through the air tanks on the suits themselves to add extra propulsion. I took extra time on the mask, each one made from graphene and cut with a laser. I wanted a gruesome face for the enemies of Titan to look on. I wanted the people to see evil cleansed by fire. I wanted them to see what happens to those who betrayed me and the company. I wanted them to see the horrible face of my avenging angels. I wanted them to fear. Proverbs 1.7 To fear the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The general was correct. Within 48 hours... 
His army was marching toward the city. I worked the entire time with a small team, sleeping only a few hours when I could no longer stay awake, and eating only when my body demanded it. Then the day came. I stood to face the army that gathered outside the city, even as we drove the traitors out of the city with fire and blood. I felt empty, as my creations drove away the last people I would ever see from Earth. I was left with a strange sense of abandonment, like a child left alone on a rainy field. I still have not heard from the board of directors of Transplanetary Energy. Perhaps they are no longer there. Maybe Earth itself no longer exists. But my people need to believe that the company will never forget them. That someday, they will return to Earth. Revelation 21.21 proclaims, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. There is no God on Titan. There is only the company. And if there is no God, there can be no Savior, unless someone here takes the burden on himself. This morning I walk through the streets of the city. There is nobody outside, except for a few that dart from one place to another, with their eyes always on the dark skies above. I walk with no fear. The avenging angels that swoop in from above would never attack me, for I am their creator. Acts 16.31 Believe in the Lord and you will be saved. You and your household. My name is Samuel T. Hillman, but people have come to call me the man from Houston. I like that. No savior was ever named Sam. But then again, no savior was ever a man. Timothy 6.16 Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen nor can see. Perhaps it's best if they just call me the Houston. You have been listening to The Ruins of Empire, The Darkness of Titan, a special release from The Ruins of Empire Project. The Ruins of Empire podcast was written by Jeremy L. Jones and produced by Sean Vincent. Cover art was Nick Martin. Music was Wounds by Ketza at ketzamusic.com, licensed under Creative Commons 3.0 license. City of Geeks. Independent new media produced in Idaho.